Bloons TD6 review. Do those words mean anything to you? Because they don't make any sense to me, and yet they are the title of a Seth video, so I will watch it. Truly, you're going to see me react to whatever this is in real time. <laughs> Let's get into it. I live in the middle of nowhere on unpronounceable street on the first floor. There's only one floor. My name is Seth Zintek. I'm 27 years old. I believe in taking care of myself. What? Okay. This is, okay, if you've ever had, this is some sort of, just a supplement. All right, that's pretty creepy. It's a European supplement with sweetener that's berry flavored. But it, it, just supplement is sort of like buying a bottle of liquid at your corner store. You could drink it. It, or you should probably not, though. In a balanced diet and a rigorous exercise. <laughs> Chase women at night. Chase women at night. Break day. Hide in plain sight. Learn their running routines. Chase women at night. Okay, wow. Seth is really, really, really taking us to the edge here. Size routine in the morning. If Whoa. Elvance 50 milligrams. Let's see. Can we learn other things? That he has here. Ah, oh, we can't. It's out of focus. It's just Elvance 50. I don't know what that does. If my hands aren't shaking, I'll take... He's got Omega-3s. He's got ly Lycan. Okay, so these are Zinc. Uh, okay, let's break down what he's got. Some of these I can't identify, right? Left here is a multivitamin. Standard stuff. Don't even know what this Pygmerium Africanium is. Not familiar. Uh, not sure what this is. Zinc. Zinc is sometimes used... Um, there's a very light amount of evidence that zinc increases free testosterone production in trained athletes. Um, so some people use it for that. Um, like, like lechin, le lectin. I don't know what that is. This giant omega-3 is usually fish oil. Um, there's a lot of evidence, uh, that fish oil or fish, like fatty fish, um, in the diet really can improve things like heart health. It can improve, um, even in some cases, mood or cognition. There's like some, some loose studies on that. Uh, but it's considered very, very just a generally good thing. And so in the supplement industries, uh, true, true commitment to capitalism, they market a product that they believe is the essence of fish oil, these fish oily fats, um, called omega threes, uh, in pill form that doesn't require refrigeration. Uh, you're probably asking yourself, it seems like if bacteria want to eat the fish, um, extracting the part that uh, creating a product that even bacteria won't touch may not be the best thing. And there's actually some evidence for that, that supplementing with omega three doesn't quite have the same, uh, beneficial effects as actually just eating fish. But nonetheless, you can have it. He's got some lion's mane. I think that's another test booster uh, or maybe an immune booster. Anyway, the point is none of these, not a, not a thing on here other than the fish oil uh, is there actually robust evidence that it does anything. 360 milligrams of extended release amphetamine while doing my daily gel session. I can do a thousand now. After I start to feel heart palpitations, I go to the vitamin closet for multivitamins. I take two gummy dinosaurs, then a gummy fruit pastel, and a single magic bee. Then okay, I'm just going to break this down for you, uh, you Zoomers that aren't connected to culture in any meaningful way. That isn't 30 second TikTok videos. What he's referencing is the intro scene from American Psycho in which Patrick Bateman, the uh, uh, psychopathic main character, discusses his morning routine as some sort of optimized super routine to prepare him for his day. It involves a lot of self-care and fitness, um, but mostly it's just a vehicle for him to self-aggrandize. So the fact that he is obviously a phenomenal degenerate is uh, it, it, popping all sorts of insane pills is is a parody of that. And I chug down two gram paracetamol to slow the approaching migraine while I prepare the rest of my routine. I always use a painkiller with little or no risk of stomach <laughs> ulceration because stomach ulcers are incredibly painful and make you die then uh seth is actually a doctor because yeah he seems to be actually like getting some of these medications correct two tabs of zinc then omega-free 
followed by a final oh vitamin d3 okay vitamin d3 oh, again a another example vitamin d is a supplement that uh purports to mimic the effects of uh, nutritionally acquired vitamin d or even uh what's the word i want like envi uh, environmentally acquired so vitamin d is produced uh, you can get it through some things like cow's milk, but primarily it's produced uh, in your body and the catalyst is sunlight, right? So your body can produce vitamin D as long as you're basically healthy by getting exposed to direct sunlight. And for most Americans, uh, in most climates, you just walking around and going outside every once in a while is going to get you enough vitamin D. Uh, a lot of people don't go outside every once in a while. So to compensate they take uh again nutritionally supplemented vitamin d and it, it it's not clear also that supplementing orally ingesting vitamin d is has the exact same effect as improving your vitamin d levels by getting actual sun sunshine but nonetheless even i will do it uh i can't actually buy vitamin d gummies because they taste so much like candy that my wife will eat them uh, probably more than you should. Though she's, she's a doctor and she's like, the lethal dose of vitamin D is nowhere close to this. And so I end up uh, buying very expensive Lifesaver gummies. Mega dose of vitamin D3. There's an idea of a Seth Seen Tech. Some kind of abstraction. But there is no real me. Only an entity. Something Silica gel. Do not eat. Illusory. And though I can hide my cold gaze and you can shake my hand and feel flesh gripping yours and maybe you can even sense our lifestyles are probably comparable. I sim I love how it also highly sus is this uh, bag of whey protein with no branding. It just says whey protein. Like that's that's pretty sus. Honestly, that's the most suspicious thing. It's sort of like the worst wine I ever bought in Italy it was just called red wine. But it was still pretty good because, you know, the Italians, they have high standards. They're pretty snooty. For, bull. For wine. I simply am not there. <laughs> Hey, hey, people. <laughs> Seth here. Hello, my little dart monkeys. It's been a while. Apologies. I had to take a short break from the hustle because if you only made two videos in six months, something's not right. And while ADHD medication is very useful to satisfy expectation and fit into the psychopathic mold of society, after seven years of regular consumption, it's good to take a break. Since withdrawal kicked in, the only thing I have energy for is getting out of bed, feeding the colony, and playing balloons. Balloons Tower Defense 6 written and pronounced as if you were dyslexic is a homeland defense simulator wait 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 is this a sponsored video was seth so oh my god so okay seth was sober i'm gonna all right i'm just gonna give you guys some insider baseball here if you're a creator i would say on a typical week i i get at least one mobile game offering a sponsorship and usually they are so trash that I just won't even say say yes. I don't. I won't even. I won't even give them the courtesy of an email. So, but the money can be pretty good. The money can be pretty good because these are cash grabs. They're often just gambling with extra steps in which you have to or pay to win. Right? They sort of become these little Skinner boxes where you get conditioned through buzzing lights or little ching 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 noises that uh you want more and you have to pay to get more of the fun noises or the positive conditioning and so they just can extract money from users uh just hand over fist and in a way that's really truly incredible that's why these uh companies are able to sponsor so much content and i try really hard to not um advertise um ga like gambling apps um, or apps I think are, are that exploitive. That said, um, if you did a dedicated video to one of these apps, um, I hope someone like Seth got paid 
like make money, like don't have to work the rest of the year money, which he should. Where you and your men are the only thing that stands between life and the complete and utter annihilation of monkey civilization. The stakes are high, but the premise might sound absurd. Rubber balloons? Really? How could that possibly be a threat to monkey civilization? I'll tell you, because it's a choking hazard. The mm. respiratory tract of a rhesus macaque is very slim, and if a child inhales enough rubber, they're Okay, I, is Seth actually a doctor? Sometimes there's a there's a there's a fair amount of his terminology that he gets really really correct. And the only other person that's so precise in their use of medical terms is uh, again my wife and her friends who are all also doctors. Going to die of asphyxiation. I've never tested this, but I'm just assuming for any. You've never felt like a degenerate, by the way, until you are silly YouTube video man in a room full of doctors. Civilization, several generations. Though Seth actually has probably felt this. Nations of high infant mortality and we're on the brink of extinction. And so, the most primitive form of monkey weaponry emerged. The original, decisive answer to the rubber question. Darts. Dart monkeys could finally pop balloons from a safe distance. However, they couldn't account for what happened next. You see, for every balloon you deflate, you get two more. That's because they reproduce faster than we can kill. But now, we've introduced natural selection to the balloon population. Tougher, more resistant fibers, translucent material, higher reproductive capacities, and even limited regeneration of lost tissue start being selected for in the balloon population, thus beginning the eternal arms race between technology and an all-consuming, rapidly evolving bioweapon. You might think this- Guys, uh, this is actually how real war, real war works, by the way. Uh, you evolve over time in response to the threats that happen. This is how actually a lot of things work, um, in which life, right, it, sort of by definition, life is something that can adapt to changing circumstances. Uh, a rock, for example, cannot change anything about its existence in response to its circumstances. It's only sort of acted upon. Um, living things what makes them different is that they can change in response to hardship they have a, a a preference between positive and negative stimuli for example you ever seen those weeds that go through cracks in the sidewalk right the seed sprouts but instead of sprouting straight up it weaves its way through the cracks in the sidewalks and emerges as a flower somewhere else right this is how uh, your my chickens have been conditioned that whenever they see me within 40 feet of the treat shed that they sprint over clucking angrily demanding that I give them dried mealworms okay this isn't an accident this is how living things respond to the hardship of having to eat regular chicken food all the time right and so it, War is the same way, right? Because war is, of course, a high stakes conflict between living beings that uh, humans, we evolve to, and we evolve tactically to these situations that we have. The Iraq war is a classic example of this rapid arms race in which the uh, insurgents of, in Iraq initially used simple explosive devices in streets that would destroy uh, soft, like, canvas skinned Humvees, right, and kill the troops within them. So quickly, the U.S. military uh, involved or created improvised armor kits. Well, then the insurgents realized that the best way bet was to make sure you blew up underneath the Humvee because there wasn't anything there. And they would blow up using pressure, uh, uh, for example, uh, infrared sensors, right, that would sense the heat of the engine cross the sensor, and then would detonate underneath the Humvee right where there wasn't any armor. Well, the U.S. military evolved in turn, developing a sort of arm that would drop down and get extremely hot. It would trigger that IR sensor prematurely, meaning that instead of blowing up right under the Humvee, it would blow up just in front of it, saving the troops' lives. The insurgents, of course, learned this and in some cases actually added a delay timer uh, to the IR sensor, but in other cases went over to a pressure plate system in which a pressure plate would complete a circuit uh, 
by the tie the rolling of the front tire over the pressure plate would complete a circuit and detonate the ied well to counteract that the u.s military actually developed a big heavy wheel or a wheeled contraption that it rolled in front of convoys uh that would trigger these pressure plate ieds and while it would destroy the big heavy wheel uh it would not kill any troops then finally of course then they would, you know, the insurgents would evolve cell phone detonators that they would actually physically have a person watch and press the button when the Humvee or vehicle was in sight. And that proved pretty effective. So the U.S. military developed IR jammer, uh, uh, electronic countermeasures, cell phone jammers that would drive around making the cell phones ineffective. So then they decided, okay, we're going to run command wire. We're going to run an actual copper wire from the IED all the way to the... Um, detonating person the detonator and that was effective and then finally the u.s military developed something they should they've been developing really from the start which is humvees or vehicles with armor on the bottom and that was decisive that was very very effective but the insurgents evolved again they developed something called um, I, I, I might get in trouble for this. It's absorbed something called an EFP, which is a copper sheet that when it explodes, it's concave and it de it has explosives on the backside. It's con yeah, it's concave. When it blows up, it pops out and becomes convex and forms this incredibly sharpened point that forms a rocket that shoots right through armor. Uh, it's pretty dangerous stuff, and you can make it in never mind um the point is it was a continually evolving process and it never stopped just like re and that's true of every war you're starting to see it in the russia ukraine war as ukrainian forces evolve their tactics their ambushing strategies uh and you're also seeing the russians evolve by developing uh improvised cages over top some of their tanks to to hopefully uh, detonate rpg their rpg cages right uh they still won't stop javelins but they'll stop um the more more prolific rpgs and so this evolution is going to keep going it never stops um because Human beings never stop thinking about ways to get ahead of their enemies. This game is a joke. And monkeys, apparently. But this review is a joke. It isn't. It's very much a crisis just got released on PC in 2007 situation, where all the critique and anger is coming from people who, one, don't own it, or two, can't run it, because they don't have the RTX 3080 necessary to even boot up the game on low settings. Like any good game, we begin. Uh, man, that's crazy. You ever smoke skooma? Uh, Joe Rogan reference. Man, that's young Joe Rogan, too. In by starting cheat engine, loading the following cheat table, hooking up the executable, and from there, enable editable values get player. Double click the action value and change it to get player info. It should update with your current values, which you edit by double clicking. Apply them by changing the action value to set player info. If you don't see anything, tab into a different menu and switch back. This Wait, is he explaining how to hack through the pay to win system? Because that's awesome. Will very likely get Get you banned. However, using every other cheat will not. You can exploit this by earning monkey money, turning on infinite monkey money, and buying anything equal to or below your total sum of monkey money without spending a single dime. Dear Ninja Kiwi, I'm sorry for telling everyone how to bypass your shitty in-game cash shop. Oh man, maybe he's not sponsored by these guys. Maybe he's literally just trolling a piece of shit mobile money. Wow. I don't do it out of pleasure. I do it out of moral obligation to inconvenience anyone and anything that comes out of New Zealand. To play the game, mm. pick a map, pick a difficulty, and try to finish it. For reference, anything under hard difficulty is meant for children. Are you a child? I hope not. How did you end up here? Did your mother leave you alone with a tablet, assuming that the cold hard expanse of the internet is somehow an appropriate surrogate to- Yeah, guys, if you haven't seen any of these weird- Sometimes are billed as ASMR, but they are make believe boyfriend and girlfriend ASMR. Um, it gives me the creeps, and I definitely doom scrolled through all of them. Um, the it, it's really weird. They're one sided conversations. They're usually a guy whispering like this, and he's being really, really affectionate, and he'll never say anything to hurt you because he loves you so much and it really is off-putting because they stare 
unbroken into the camera in a way that you never will with an actual partner. No human being will ever look at you like this unless they're preparing to eat you or they're an ASMR boyfriend. If I look at the analytics and I see that this segment uh, has like this huge spike where people are like, Paul, I'm in love with you. Maybe I'll become ASMR boyfriend, right? Um, but but I would just be, I would be bad. I would be, I would be bad at this. Uh, Parental attention, in which case. I also, my wife may have issues with this. I'm incredibly sorry. I'm sure your parents will take full person. I love this Karen stock photo. Personal accountability. I wonder if this is just a stock photo for like, Shitty mom. Ability for your impending developmental issues. <laughs> okay, I wonder if he's psych. Man, okay. Inter Journal of Behavioral Addiction, North Clinic of Istanbul. Okay, weird. European Neuropsychopharmacological Clinic and Current Psychiatry Review. 2012, 2017, 2018, 2017. Damn, dude, it have you not looked at anything published? This dude needs to get access to up to date, right? There's there's so many more uh, uh, journal articles that someone like Seth should absolutely be able to hack into those stupid paywall journals and get access to the text of these. But I digress. As my good friend, man, because there's definitely been a lot more internet driven research in the past five years about the relationship between our piece of shit phones that I don't even have. Where is it? Where it's not near me. Not near me. Uh, our piece of shit phones and the way they cripple our mental health. And Delora Gaming often says, can we stop discussing children? Hard is the starting baseline difficulty. Think of it as a rite of passage before the game considers you competent enough to stand a chance of winning the actual game. The actual game is Chimps Mode, an acronym which stands for no continues, no hearts lost, no income, no monkey knowledge, no powers, and no selling. Effectively, pay to win is no longer an option, and a single mistake will undo your entire run. It is the truest test of monkey fortitude. Basically, huh. you're training yourself up to handle the worst this game can throw at you without any help. There's many monkeys and many balloons. Different balloons require different monkeys to sufficiently deflate and destroy them. While the most basic and primordial balloon, the red balloon, can be popped by any monkey, the situation quickly becomes more complicated as most balloons come in layers, including, but not limited to, camo, lead, ceramic, LGBT, each with their own properties, strengths, and weaknesses. They also come in sizes, regular and blimp, also known as Moabs, BFBs, Zongs, and Bads. These this is insane. Is this how all these tower defense games works? Like in lore, things just get deeper and deeper and deeper. What's interesting in the military, of course, uh, it's not as popular now, but in the Cold War, uh, training soldiers to identify the silhouettes of Soviet armored vehicles and Soviet aircraft uh, was a huge deal. It was seen as really important to be able to accurately identify uh, armor and aircraft. And so you would be trained to discern them from different silhouettes. So you'd learn armor viewed from a horizon and you'd learn aircraft from a top-down silhouette. Of course, if you look up and you see the aircraft directly overhead, it's probably a bad sign. These initially serve as boss encounters, which, following the Dark Souls Miyazaki school of thought, eventually become regular enemies. In general, these are gigantic, gestating balloon females, which, upon popping, release their entire brood on the battlefield. I would say these are generally slow, generally, until round 90, when you encounter your first DDT. After 20 minutes of play, which you're going to lose in two seconds, there is a common anecdote on the Balloons TD6 Reddit. Never ask a woman her age, a man his Gallery and Ninja Kiwi, how they recorded their Moab popping sound. Let's talk about monkeys. In total, there's 22 different monkeys. This is so weird. This is so weird that he would take a a, a a shitty tower defense mobile game. But I mean, I guess, I don't know, man. I mean, I guess if you're used to like high octane games, this is what you want. But like this doesn't sound high octane. This just sounds like a like a dopamine uh, again a Skinner box that conditions you through the first fifty rounds to feel good, and then when you get stalled out, you end up in pay to win mode. Monkeys across four different trees: primary, military, magic, and support. Each has their own purpose and place on the battlefield. Dart monkey is your OG shooter. Boomerang monkey has curved shots and can switch hands. Bomb shooter counters lead. Tack shooter counters everything else. Ice monkey. Glue Gunner 
Nobody knows what they do because nobody picks them. Sniper Monkey has infinite range. Monkey sub bottoms for the monkey dom. Monkey <laughs> what? Buccaneer upgrades to the entire East India trade. This has never been less engaging content, by the way. But one of the things he's sort of alluding to is the importance of combined arms operations. And if you look, there was actually an interview very briefly with David Petraeus breaking down the Russian failure in Ukraine. And one of the things that he cited as a failure is what is called combined arms operations. And this is the idea that you have ground forces, aircraft, naval forces that are working together to ensure mutual support. And an example would be ground forces only advancing as far as their aircraft can cover. And if the Ukraine aircraft cannot, or if Russian aircraft cannot extend enough to cover their uh, armored convoys, then those armored convoys become vulnerable to attacks from the air by Ukrainian air forces. And so combined arms says that you work together, that the uh, ground forces prevent the establishment of anti-aircraft positions of air defense, and the aircraft provide cover for the ground forces, right? It's really complicated, and it involves a lot of talking and a lot of in-the-weed sort of maneuvering, right? That aircraft has to say right away if they think there's an anti-air site and get it communicate it not to their headquarters who talks to their headquarters who talks to their headquarters who talks to the army headquarters who tells their subordinate their subordinate their subordinate and you know two days later the convoy commander knows that there's an air defense system he needs to suppress they need to talk directly to one another while their headquarters can still track what's going on right so that aircraft says hey rpg or sam missile site 300 meters to, to your west, and that convoy commander's got to go, Roger, we're on it. And he tells his BTR and his dismounted infantry, hey, you need to push now into this SAM missile site. Like, we're going to support you. It's not easy because it involves low level commanders, right? It involves having these 22, 23, 24 year olds who can who aren't just able to, you know, follow orders and, and be like an orc in Warcraft going like, oh, right, right away, sir. You know, they have to actually think. They have to solve their problem and be like, okay, our aircraft's on station. They want me to do this. I've got this force array, right? I don't, I can't wait for the generals to give me orders. I have to go now. This is what makes combined arms operations so challenging. But when they're effective, they're very, very hard to organize a defense against because there's always a solution in place, right? There's always, you, you sort of like what we talked about earlier, the maximum number number of tools are at your disposal. So you can, in real time, adapt to changing circumstances on the ground because you have so many powerful tools. Need drone reconnaissance? Great. Need, uh, you know, a, a recon by fire? Can do. You know, you have dismounted infantry, but maybe you need to reach out with a tank. Well, you can do that if you have, but that's only if you have true combined arms effects in play. If you don't have the, you can have all the parts, but if your people can't do the work, the actual nitty gritty coordination, then you are not, you're out of luck. You're, you're not going to be able to do uh, combined arms. And that's what he's talking about is you see different monkeys, different specializations, different uh, domains, and yet they're able to work together to take out these balloons. Company Monkey Ace has nuclear capabilities. Heli Pilot can solo the game. Mortar Monkey is incredibly accurate. Dartling Gunner comes with his own panic button. Ninja Monkey counters stealth. Wizard Monkey counters your ability to see. Super Monkey will be discussed at a later time. Alchemist turns lead into gold. Druid turns crops into gold. Banana Farm turns bananas into centralized banking. Monkey Village supports the home front. Spike Factory keeps out the homeless. And Engineer Monkey is somehow less popular than the ice monkey. In reality, you don't have to know all that. All you need to know is the current meta pick, so you can turn your brain off for half an hour and still scavenge some dopamine for your zoomy receptors. E mm, man, wow, he and I made the exact same joke. I love it. Each monkey comes with three different upgrade trees, which are mutually exclusive to each other. You can pursue one tree up to five and benefit from two levels of another. When we talk strategy, we use the free number nomenclature, which denotes the number of upgrades 
coins in each tree in descending order. For this is way too complicated for a mobile click tower defense game. Example, this is what it looks like when I smack down a 103 dart monkey, a 200 village, and a 301 alchemist. This is handy to know when somebody starts screaming at you that a 401 alchemist is not the same as a 402, that you're wasting precious animation frames on something that doesn't benefit you, that you have effect- <laughs> First of all, let's read this Reddit comment from one year ago. Firstly, a 401 ALK is not the same fucking thing as a 402 ALK. You have essentially lost efficiency because they'll be throwing acid instead of putting acid mix plus berserk brew on the monkeys that actually matter. You have pretty much spent more money to completely gimp your alchemist. Now he's got 10k dumped into him to achieve less than you did before. Honestly, if you cannot look at 401 and 402 and tell me they're the same thing, you can't distinguish basic background details in your environment, a basic and essential human function that's performed by some of the most infantile members of our race on this considered neck yourself you mouth breathing moron wow and this is this is this is s defax bomber 6340 responding to boomer shooter tutor hooter Effectively gimped yourself out of an expensive investment, and instead of playing balloons, you should instead consider the rope. The balloons could That's actually what he says in that comment. Community is nothing if not passionate. On top of that, you have heroes. There's many to choose from, so choose wisely, because you only get to bring one of them. These include Quincy, who never whiffs, not a single arrow. Sada, my beloved. Adora, who is adorable, and also powered by blood sacrifice, in the same way as a 33rd degree maid. Benjamin. Whoa, dark on a number of levels. Who stacks the Benjamins and contributes? Okay, this is actually great. The office worker monkey. It's nothing else. This is one of the things, the other things that we've talked about. Again, a Ukraine invasion reference. This is also being filmed in like the 6th of March, right? By the 12th of March, I sure everything will be totally different and this will sound irrelevant, but bear with me. Uh, logistics are important. And you know what? Who does logistics? People in chairs with spreadsheets and timetables. They live and die by it. They're nerdy. They're detail-oriented. They're often very unpleasant. They often don't know what day or time it is. That's how I was when I was in logistics because my planning window, if I was doing my job correctly, was so far in the future that it was immaterial whether it was the week of the 6th or the week of the 12th, right? I was concerned about Q2, the next quarter and the following quarter and the following quarter. So... All that to say that, Benjamin, these are the guys, this is the monkey version of, a, of the people who make this whole operation work. We've talked about it. Delta Force is only Delta Force, or SEAL Team 6 is only SEAL Team 6, because their planes fly every time. Their intel is top-notch. Their weapons are always perfectly maintained, zeroed, and the gear is, is second to none, right? They have all the training they need. They have the best food, and all of those things are what make them effective, right? It's just like the tip of the spear is only good if the spear is made of something hard, right? If all you can have, the tip of the cardboard spear isn't going to do anything. And so, yeah, and I get it. The Call of Duty world, we fetishize um, the person, the man, the, the individual fighter. And don't get me wrong, nothing works without them. But uh, a starving man, a uh, man with no ammunition, the wrong weapons, they don't, they can't bring the fight. They're just not going to. We're not without the, an army of these dudes trying to forecast exactly what's needed, when and where, and how to get it there. Picking him in a multiplayer game is considered a form of griefing, at best, and at worst, a hate crime. And of course, Funny Tank Monkey, and many more. So, let's talk about strategy. You're gonna open with Quincy into a 301 Ninja, followed by a 200 Alchemist. Upgrade Alchemist to 301, Ninja to 402. Smack down a 200 Monkey Village, then place your free 20 Heli Pilot, Alchemist to 401, Heli to 420, Village to 30. And finally, finish your 520 Heli Pilot. There, as your current meta pick clears everything from hard to chimps with minimal thinking. But who cares? Secondly, it's not an to win advanced and expert level maps and it's certainly not enough to beat boss events there's two bosses and they rotate every week blunarius the inflator and the lich i say this unironically i've seen a lot of 
erotic illustrations of Blunarius. Porn, if you will. And uh, it makes me act up. Boss events are interesting. On the one hand, yes, you can pay to this is win. On the other hand, it's not gonna save you. Because for reference, the last round of chimps, round 100, features a single BAD. This has 28,000 HP. Tier 5 Blunarius spawns round 120 with 3 million. And if it's elite Blunarius, 40 million. So how do we overcome numbers that big? Simple. We finance the war with money we don't have. We need free bits of monkey knowledge from a support tree. Bigger D. This is preposterous but also completely true in fact some of the earliest advent of um like proto i'm gonna say proto capitalism right came in the um it came in the middle ages in at least in western europe um when kings would have to raise armies and go fight and conquer in other countries territories but to do that right they would oftentimes collect taxes but that system wasn't that effective because you have to think it involved going out taxing people and then taking those gold that gold or resources and then spending it to raise the army you go conquer you fight your enemies and then you come back and the idea was of course you would take territory or plunder or loot and that it would actually be a profitable enterprise and you started to see over time that uh, these kings would run out of money. They loved conquering so much, and it allowed them to take their peskiest members of the court and move them away from the place where they could stage a coup and to the battlefield where they could get stabbed in the throat with an arrow and no one would say anything. So in order to uh, facilitate more warfare, uh, kings had to raise more money. And so sometimes they would sit there and promise. They'd say, listen, merchants, because there was a new middle class emerging in Europe after the plague, they would say, listen, I know you have money. And yes, you've paid your taxes, but we, we, we need more. So if you give me some, I will share, I will return your money from this war venture with a little bit extra. And they started to say, oh, okay, so like we invest in this enterprise and it returns to us. And that idea, these it was like a proto version of classic, like like capitalism in the doctrinal sense, which is, i.e., you use raised capital, brought, borrowed at an interest rate to invest in capital, uh, to invest in enterprises that are expected to return a greater amount of wealth resources deals backroom deals bank deposits naturally we take benjamin for increased stacking of benjamins then you convert your first monkey farm into a 240 giving us access to imf loans imf standing for the international monkey fund take the loan deposit twice wait a single round collect interest cash out and repeat use borrowed money to make more money to make more banks to take more loans to borrow more money then a oh guys yeah this is actually uh exactly how these schemes work if you have access to extremely low cost uh borrowing then you have the opportunity to if you have let's say you can get a loan at three percent interest rate now let's say that you can invest in something that offers a return of six percent well, you have created the same money factory, right? Now, let's say, now obviously investments are not guarantees, but let's say you could risk adjust it. You risk adjusted uh, rate of return is still like 4%. You go, huh, this is, an, this is a way to make money, right? And this is what you see in, for example, the modern housing market where individuals who have access to the, the usually a small down payment, like a quarter of the value of the real estate or sometimes even less, will go and they'll say, okay, I will take this 3% loan, right? 3% interest rate loan, this chunk of money that I'm paying 3% on, I'll buy a property with it, knowing that if the general rate of inflation in the country is, let's say 7%, that on average, you could buy any asset that's persistent, real estate, a used car, anything, and just camp on it. And if it raises at 7% in value and your loan on your interest is three, then actually the longer you have this asset and the slower you pay off your loan, the more the delta is going to be between your asset growing, the money earned from the asset and the uh, 
price of the money that you've borrowed, the amount you'll actually owe in pay in interest. If this sounds complicated, it's not. It's exactly what he's describing, especially if you take the money you've made by exploiting those difference in rate of return versus interest rates, right? And this is sort of core to, core to capitalism, but it's how these things work. Um, you exploit that delta and then you roll it into even greater loans investing in even larger assets. And so this is how when people talk about rich people have a lot of debt, this is what they mean. They mean that they will take a chunk of money, leverage it through loans to something even greater, and then invest in other profitable enterprises again and again and again. Upgrade your bank to 250 or monkeynomics with the descriptor for when you're too big to fail, thus creating the Federal Reserve. And now we print money directly out of thin air. Inflation? <laughs> Don't worry about it. Take more loans, print more money. Get a 500 nuclear sub so we can borrow, print, and spend even faster. But uh, what exactly are we spending towards? We're spending towards a very expensive sacrifice because ultimately there's only one way to win war blood a lot of blood money is merely the vehicle to convince you we uh, just need you to die and so fittingly the strongest tower in the game requires a mountain of sacrifice consuming everything and everyone around it twice because there's two upgrades the true sun god is uh, is the second strongest tower in the game if you're currently seeing this it means i fucked up and I have to reset. The vengeful, true sun god is the strongest tower in the game. Also, the leading cause of aneurysms each time I miss a single step in this 35-page wiki article. Jesus. But he is worth the effort. He can solo the entire boss on normal. On elite difficulty, however, you have to fill every square pixel of your screen with monkeys, sacrifice them all, only to receive a low-degree paragon and quit the game very calmly. Confused? Then I invite you I am so confused. Jesus. You to read the 39 page wiki article. Consult this simple mathematical formula for power calculation and come back just as confused. Paragons are tier six monkeys. However, they're this is this is a level of depth and lore that is beyond comprehension. Their strength is determined by their degree, which is a measure. I mean, this is also one of those really uncomfortable revelations is when you realize that an entire economy based on war kind of still works. And I say that because obviously it is not as productive as investing in things like, you know, technology that helps people uh, directly. But you can have this. I, again, the U.S. economy after, during the Great Depression was, well, depressed. And during World War II, a massive influx of government spending and massive government contracts to put the country on a war footing, literally creating and buying products that the government would then go and literally blow up. Uh, and it burned not just physical capital, but human capital too. It scooped up large numbers of people, uh, working age males exclusively, out uh, forcibly out of the economy and put them into uh roles that were you know not delivering economic value they were fighting a war and it was moral but we're talking about a purely economic analysis of these events and when you do that right you create some favorable economic conditions right wages rise because there's fewer workers uh, and much more work to do and you have government stepping in and regulating, but in exchange, it hands out a lot of contracts, a lot of money uh, can get made. And it, it can work. It can be a functioning way to, to run or jumpstart an economy. Uh, some of, one of the darker conspiracy theories that I sort of have is that one of the big drivers of the Iraq war was the fact that the US economy needed a little pick-me-up from the recession it entered after uh, 2000, uh, really in 2001. And so creating a large-scale military operation would pump a lot of money into the economy while simultaneously achieving U.S. foreign policy objectives. Uh, it didn't really achieve U.S. foreign policy objectives, but it did help create the sort of pick the economy back up and drive it towards ever greater heights that ended in 2008. So did it really help? It's tough to say. Fundamentals are something you can't ever really escape in an economy. And, you know, the warfare economy 
it can, again, it can work. It can work, but it, it the trade-off costs uh, as a society can be pretty huge. Oftentimes, those workers would be better off attempting to contribute to the economy um, in in more productive ways, right? Obviously, killing people or destroying infrastructure, or making products that are then destroyed doesn't actually help. There's still going to be a fundamental shortage issue. Measure of equality and quantity of sacrifices given. There's four in total. Under optimal conditions, to create all four, we have to put about 200 monkeys into body bags, but the sacrifice is well justified. It's pretty much the only way you can madness. possibly clear a boss run on elite difficulty. There's many more modes in this game. Odysseys, which are monkey campaigns. Races, which are going to get me banned someday. Custom challenges, which have to be played yourself after making them to ensure that it's actually possible to beat. Instead, I use Cheat Engine to make maps that are physically impossible to finish and post them online for unsuspecting victims. And of <laughs> course, multiplayer. Wait, my monkey Wall Street. Which looks a little like this. <laughs> Jesus, it really can't be rendered. Where, where are the blades <laughs> coming from? <laughs> What's doing that? <laughs> Multiplayer is the shit. Arguably, it's harder than single player because you all share the same income. This leads to the inevitable situation based Keanu, Lifeless Loser, and Seth Zine Tench, where everybody picks Benjamin, buys a turn 12 banana farm, and we lose the game. It's a lot of fun. It's incredibly fun, interactive, and dynamic when one of your friends pops down a sun temple right next to your farms, consuming all of your income. Watch this. <laughs> oh! Why'd everything go fuck? by? What? Did I clear the whole map? What the fuck? In the industry, this is known as a skill issue. To answer a question I've been hearing, what is Balloons Tower Defense 6? It is when you can physically no longer see what you're doing. When the screen is filled with so much shit. This is the embodiment of war. Chaos. No one knows what's going on. This is with a real fog of war. It's not actually the fog of Warcraft. It's just madness. Some things are real, some things aren't. But all you're left with is an assault of flashing lights and popping. That's what Bloom's TD6 is all about. It's amazing. Also, how much you can handle on screen? Great benchmark for your hardware. Because you'll get somebody talking shit about how great their processor is. Just because Rakesh at the Dell store told them so. And suddenly, they drop from the game. Been real quiet ever since. I do, however, have some critique. I've heard so many pops that I've developed tinnitus. I've listened to the soundtrack for so long that if I hear it alone in isolation, my brain fills in the gaps and creates audible popping. But I think that's a fair price to pay. Also, also, New Zealand company jacks up the in-game price of the Australian flag. Very based. <laughs> Uh, that's a great little troll in there. I love it. Fortunately, this game does run like ass sometimes. It doesn't like being left in the background, and it doesn't close properly for me. So, I made a little batch file to kill the process. I recommend you do the same. It does save progress on maps, so usually you don't lose anything. I think anybody can enjoy Balloons TD6. I saw one of the top reviews with some guy saying... <laughs> it helped him get over his divorce. If it could help him, maybe it can help you. Bef this is... This is madness. This is the way of madness. But the one thing that it does illustrate is how good command works. If you've done everything right, if you've trained your soldiers correctly, if you've given them the right plans and protocols, if you've arrayed your forces properly, when the time comes, when the decisive battle actually happens... You need to make just a few key decisions to get you the W. That's it. That's the best way to be a commander. For you, cast it off as a joke and an unserious suggestion. Consider the possibility that you live in a tyrannical society where, at any time, you can be muzzled, beaten, and put into captivity until you die. Considering these things, maybe it's not a joke. Maybe you're the clown, and the punchline is your entire existence. In summary, Balloons TD6, 10 out of 10. Very recommended. Very fun. The price is very affordable. If you can't, I recommend gaslighting family members into giving you money blackmailing relatives, or petty crime. Remember? Petty crime's an option, yeah. Not gonna act like it's not. Always under a thousand. That's the threshold for felonies. Gotta keep- Mmm. In the United States, friends. 
And just because it's not a felony, in fact, you may be better off doing federal time because I'll tell you, some of those state prisons are rough. That record, squeaky clean. Or, as I've heard it said, get that fong out yo boosy, playa. <laughs> as always, more... <laughs> Uh, I also want to point this out. There's a great channel called Kamikaze Cash, which is another just degenerate finance channel, which uh, after my own heart truly as a finance uh, degenerate or someone he wishes he was. Uh, I they He has an entire series called Freeloading in which he profiles ways to make money by staking crypto, participating in studies, filling out surveys, and generally trying to fund a neat lifestyle. His actual goal is to do so so much, get so many tendy bucks that he actually buys an apartment complex, which, again, a man after my own heart. More content to come, so stay tuned. This is the end of good videos. Here on out, there are no good videos. I'm tired of living in fear of some commenter coming at me saying, uh, Seth, you actually made a f f factual error. Correct. I did. And I'll do it again without the muzzle of quality control. I yeah, guys, listen, uh, there's a saying, the perfect is the enemy of the good. I, yeah, I get it, guys. You should, if you don't follow Seth at this point, I don't know what to, what to tell you. Um, his content is always great. Uh, and if it's not, I'll tell him in the comments. Now, here's the thing, dude. Uh, if I could tell Seth anything, it'd be this. Just it, it, your content can be as weird and as jank as you want and all fucked up and nobody cares. I mean, I care that it's like entertaining, but like if you want to make something, you should just do it. Um, the, the crippling, crushing burden of appeasing people um, is just not worth it. It's not worth putting your putting that on you. Anyway, guys, thanks so much for joining me. Hopefully you learned something about tactics and warfare and blowing up balloons. If you want uh, to, you know, flow. if you want to get access to more exclusive content, Patreon is the place, right? I want to thank our lieutenant tier patrons, uh, Cole Foster, Command Unit, Caffeinated, Jakob Flavius, Chris, Dr. Shadow Cop, Portal World, and Time. Um... Yep, those guys doing us a solid. Get access to some exclusive content, exclusive rooms on the Discord, and follow me on Twitch, twitch.tv slash combatvetpaul. I stream three-ish, three to four days a week, and that's it. Until next time, catch you guys later.